So welcome everybody to the Good Day Seminar. We have the pleasure to have with us Dr. Yanis Danduras. Let me say a few words for those that you are not familiar with his work. Uh, Yanis Danduras is a researcher at uh, IRAP, Institute de Research and Astrophysique at Planetology, and Pla at Planetology in Toulouse, which is part of the French National Center for Scientific Research, CENRES. He's a renowned space scientist with multiple contributions in the study of the terrestrial space environment, the Earth's magnetosphere, and other planetary magnetospheres in our solar system, together with their moons, i.e. moon magnetosphere interactions, atmospheres, etc. He's the principal investigator of the CIS experiment of ESA's cluster mission, a co-investigation in the MIMI experiment of the Cassini spacecraft, and he's also involved in various other projects, such as Sirena, experiment of ESA's Baby Colombo mission, etc. Yanis was tasked by ESA to form an international research team that would address the science scopes and objectives for studying the lunar space environment within the framework of the European participation in the Lunar Gateway mission, which is part of NASA's Artemis program. Today, Yanis will explain the science opportunities provided by the Lunar Gateway program to study space plasma physics from moon orbit, from moon's orbit and from the moon's surface, which is as a more general interest, of course. So you're very welcome. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And we're looking forward to listening to your talk. All the space available. Okay. If I put it there, then we don't. We will have all the the bottom no, line. No, no, it's not the bottom line. I'm not sure. Uh, please mute your. Κύριε Αλεσανδράκη, μπορείτε να κάνετε μνιούτ το σύνδεσή σας. Οκ. Για να φύγει το κάτω. Για να φύγει, γιατί μπορούσα να το κρατάει ενεργό. Αυτό το πρόβλημα. Θέλω να πάνω. Α, We are listening. Okay. Dear Dr. Patsis, thank you very much for your kind words and for your kind invitations. And in particular, a uh, thanks uh, also to Dr. Diaginas for inviting me and of course to uh, 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 Professor Krimidzis. It's a pleasure to be all together and to, and to have this uh, seminar. So let's get directly into the subject and about the plasma environment, space plasma environment of the moon. Actually, during 21 to 22 days, every lunar orbit, so, uh, the moon on its orbit around the Earth is directly exposed to the solar wind. Since it does not have a magnetic field to deviate charged particles, it does not have a collisional atmosphere, it's directly exposed to the solar wind, so we have particles of the order of uh, a few KVs. We start from electrons in the sub KV uh, domain and go up to a few KVs. Solar energetic particles during solar events can go up to several MeVs. To Jovian energetic electrons, when uh, 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 the moon is through the interplanetary magnetic field connected to the Jovian magnetosphere, to galactic cosmic rays that can go up to several GeV and to anomalous cosmic uh, uh, rays, uh, uh, which are interstellar, uh, uh, which uh, pick up ion from the interstellar atoms. So although all these populations have different sources, when they are superposed, they uh, create an almost continuous that go from the sub KeV uh, domain up to the GeV domain. This was already understood from the early Apollo days. Actually, the first scientific experiment Ever, ever put by a human on a planetary body other than the Earth was the Apollo solar wind composition experiment. It was very simple, but it was a very clever idea. There was an aluminum foil 
that was exposed to the solar wind. So solar wind ions were implanted on this foil. Then they were brought back, back by the astronauts to the University of Bern. Actually, the PA of the experiment was uh, Johann Geis of the University of Bern. They were analyzed and they gave the uh, elemental and also the isotopic composition of the solar wind. Actually, this, these were the first measurements from a sample from the uh, solar atmosphere. And still today, they constitute a, a very accurate reference of the uh, element and isotopic composition of the solar wind. And just to tell uh, a story, uh, uh, on, the co uh, uh, on the corner of this foil, uh, there was pr uh, uh, printed, made in Switzerland, and there was a pictogram of the Swiss flag. So the whole experiment was nicknamed the Swiss flag experiment. And so the Swiss flag was put on the moon before the American a flag was put, but uh, uh, let's get, get uh, back to our uh, main uh, 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 subject. And as you can see, the moon's vicinity during this period is typical of deep space. And now we're going to see one after the other, all of these uh, uh, components of the uh, 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 plasma environment of the moon. So here we have typical solar wind followed by ICME, interplanetary coronal mass ejection. These are data taken upstream from the Earth by the cluster uh, as spacecraft, but it's the same environment that to which the moon can also be exposed. At the top, we have two energy time spectrum for hydrogen. And for helium double plus, we have the normal solar wind. It's, this, it's a very narrow energy band, which shows that it's a very cold beam of the order just above 1 keV. And then we have the ICME, shock arrival and we see a jump a jump in energy both in hydrogen and alpha particles a jump in temperature because the the, the beam becomes broader and and also a jump in the uh, in, in the velocity as you can see here and uh, 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 we see this uh, uh, very strong increase in density and of course on the so all of these the particles arrive on the moon surface. What can happen there? One is that some of these ions, they get implanted on the lunar regolith. Some of them get reflected and they get reflected either as ions or they are subject to a charge exchange interaction. They reflect as energetic neutral atoms. Here we have a simulation and here we have the observations on the right side, we have the typical solar wind spectrum. And here we have the energy spectrum of the reflected energetic neutral atoms. So there is some loss of energy, but again, they convey some information on the uh, solar wind. So this is one part of the interaction. The other is that this hydrogen contributes to the water cycle of the moon, because these hydrogen atoms, when they get are uh, implanted on the lunar regolith, they can interact with oxides from uh, uh, the minerals on the lunar regolith, they can uh, form hydroxyl radicals. And these hydroxyl radicals contribute to, the, to a, a water molecule formation. So there is a whole water cycle on the moon. And one of the open questions are, what is the relative role of the two different sources of these water molecules. One, as we saw, is the solar wind, solar wind protons. The other is water uh, brought by asteroid or comets. And we don't know what's the relative role of these uh, two. And of course, uh, they can be thermal resorbed, they can uh, be great, they, they can contribute to the exosphere. Then uh, uh, the other part of the interaction is that these ions, they interact with local magnetic anomalies. Although the moon does not have a global magnetic field, there are some remnant magnetic fields that are what we call mini magnetospheres. These are actually the smallest natural magnetospheres that we have in our solar system. And th th this local magnetic field can shield the, ex uh, uh, the, uh, the moon regolith from being exposed to the solar wind. Here we, on the top, we have a, a, a simulation by uh, Ruth Banford and uh, her colleagues. And at the bottom, we have a photo of the Rainer Gamma Magnetic Anomaly. And we see this uh, a, a color contrast. This is due ubic to the fact that here, the, the, the white uh, part is a part that's not exposed in solar wind due exactly to this shielding effect. So uh, they, they do not suffer the space weathering due to the exposure on this uh, uh, solar wind population. 
And then as we go up in energy, we have the solar energetic particles. Here we have a solar event. Actually, it was measured on the Earth environment, but it, it's indicated what that happens also uh, on the moon where we have typical SCP intensities and with the arrival of the uh, 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 of, of the perturbation and the go in energy from a few MeV up to even hundreds of MeV. And then as we go higher and higher in energy, we have the galactic cosmic rays. Here, over several years, we can see early uh, uh, see the modulation due to the 11 year solar cycle. Actually, when we have the maximum of the, uh, uh, the, the, the solar maximum, we have a strong interplanetary magnetic field that uh, deviates uh, the, the galactic cosmic rays and we get a minimum. On the left part, we have the uh, for hydrogen and the right part, we have the fluxes for oxygen. And so downward, solar energetic particles and galactic cosmic rays can be measured in orbit around the moon or even on the surface. And this, uh, I, I have a normal gyro radii. So the location of the moon does not matter because uh, the, uh, these particles, uh, they have very large gyro radii. Gyro radii. And since the moon does not have a substantial magnetic field, it is possible to measure even the low energy part of the galactic cosmic spectrum that's below one GeV. Most of the measurements that we now have of galactic cosmic rays are from Earth orbit, where the, the, uh, the, uh, the low energy part is partially filtered out by the Earth's magnetosphere. Whereas on the moon, we not, would not have this filtering, so we can even go to the lowest energy uh, component of the galactic cosmic rays. Also, uh, uh, on Earth, the galactic cosmic rays, they are mixed with the trapped radiation belt species, whereas it's not the case of the moon. So the moon is the ideal place to study pristine galactic cosmic rays. Now, what happens when these uh, galactic cosmic rays or solar energetic particles interact with the moon regularly? Actually, they can penetrate, they can provoke, if they have enough energy, nuclear reactions, so they can uh, create cosmogenic nuclides that they are uh, used for dating parts of the regolith. Also, they can suffer several collisions and they create secondaries, fast neutrons or other particles that they come out of the regolith. On the right side, we have a simulation using the Giant for uh, 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 software. On, with dashed lines, we have the pristine galactic cosmic rays for protons, alphas, and ions. And on the continuous lines, we have what we call the albedo particles. That's all these particles that are secondary. They are the result of the interaction of galactic cosmic rays with the moon regolith, and they come out. And as we see, their energies are lower, but the composition is much more rich than what we had initially. And I would like to highlight two of the components. One is the neutrons, which is this uh, 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 yellow component. The other are the gammas, this uh, uh, green component. The gammas, they, they have a spectrum which has characteristic lines for the composition of the a nuclei in the regolith, so it can be, be, uh, be used uh, as a monitor of, of this composition. And the neutrons, which were absent in, the, in this in, 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 in initial uh, 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 population that uh, uh, was uh, 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 simulated. They have high fluxes and they are very important because they can have uh, 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 strong biological effects on the astronauts. Since they are not charged, they penetrate deeper uh, uh, under uh, the skin. And the other uh, uh, interesting part of this interaction is that this albedo, particles and particularly the albedo protons, their flux are very sensitive to the degree of the hydration of the regolith. Because the galactic cosmic rays, the great uh, particles that are scattered on the, uh, 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 on, on, on the protons of the hydroxyl uh, radicals. Here we have a simulation of the albedo proton fractional difference between wet and dry as a function of the depth in the regolith. And when we go to depth of about 10 centimeter, we see that this 
tertiary protons, albedo protons are much higher. So any difference in the albedo particle suggests variable interaction with subsurface. This means that these albedo particles, they can be used as a monitor of the hydration degree of the regolith. And then that happens during 21 or 22 days every lunar orbit. The remaining five or six days of the lunar orbit, the moon gets into the Earth's magnetotail. And then it is subject to several phenomena as plasmoids released from the near Earth magnetosphere and propagating tailwards during uh, 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 geomagnetic storms and sources, hot plasma flows, magnetic reconnection, plasma sheet dynamics, or ion outflow from the ionosphere. Actually, what happens is that from the oral ionosphere, we have ions that are accelerated, either hydrogen or heavier ions as oxygen, uh, atomic nitrogen, uh, uh, atomic nitrogen ions, or even molecular uh, uh, ions that are there, accelerate into the magnetosphere and they propagate down tail. And the moon is exposed to this environment. How deep into the tail can these ions be observed? Here we have some observations from the geotail spacecraft. Actually, they were taken very deep uh, into the tail at 146 Earth radii. That's about 900,000 kilometers down tail at high energies, 87 keV and 136 keV. And we see the presence of uh, at, uh, nitrogen ions, oxygen ions, and molecular ions streaming down tail. And on the right side, we have the fluxes of downstreaming in the magnetotail O plus ions as a function of the distance to the tail. And where is the moon? Here at 60 R. So the moon is ideally situated to study this escaping terrestrial ions streaming down tail. Here, and we have some simulations of these uh, uh, downstream terrestrial ions. Actually, it's unique geomagnetic storms that have the higher fluxes. On the dashed lines, we have the average flux in red for uh, uh, oxygen, in blue for hydrogen. And uh, in continuous lines, we have the, uh, the peak values. And typically, they can go up to uh, a, a few kinds of KVs. And the peak energy can even approach 1 MeV, which is indicative of all the accelerations mechanisms that undergo into the, in the terrestrial uh, magnetosphere. How the science are, are, are arrive to the moon? Here we have some uh, simulations by Carnet et al. Actually, initially they get trapped into the inner magnetosphere. Here we have their trajectories, and then they get kicked, kicked up, they stream down tail, and the moon is here at 60 Earth radii. So these are simulations, but have they been really observed in the moon environment? The answer is yes. And I show an example from the Kaguya lunar uh, orbit. orbiter. This is uh, a paper by Terada et al. published in Nature. Here we have the energy. Here we have the flux. In black is hydrogen. In red is oxygen. And on oxygen, we clearly see two different populations. One is this low energy energetic uh, oxygen ion population that goes up to a few tens of electron volts. And these are uh, 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 ions originating directly from the moon, from the moon exosphere that they have been ionized and picked up. Whereas here, the right part is energetic oxygen ions originating from terrestrial magnetosphere and streaming down tail. What happens to these ions when they arrive on the moon surface? Actually, they interact with the lunar regolith and they can trade some atomic uh, uh, layers within it. Here we have some simulations on the, on the left side for 10 keV oxygen ions impinging on the lunar regolith, and we see that they can penetrate uh, typically 100 atomic layers. Here, for the same energy, we have molecular oxygen ions. Actually, when they arrive, they are fragmented, and we get uh, the, two, the two components, two oxygen ions, and the penetration depth in this case of the order of 60 atomic layers. So they get implanted into the lunar regolith. This means that all the samples from the moon brought back by the astronauts, they contain these uh, atoms that they come from terrestrial atmosphere and they have been accumulated over several million years. What does this mean? This means that we can use this heavy ions transport to the moon as uh, 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 samples of the terrestrial atmosphere evolution. Here we have 
from a paper by Cutting and Zang, the evolution of the composition of the terrestrial atmosphere from today, zero, it's on the right side, going back to about 40 billion years ago. And we see that the composition of the terrestrial atmosphere has been changing. One, for example, a, a re re remarkable evolution is 24 billion years ago, the great oxidation event, which was due to the enrichment of terrestrial atmosphere in oxygen. And this was due to the multiplication of cyanobacteria that they were making photosynthesis and they were producing oxygen. So this is the origin of oxygen in the terrestrial atmosphere. Before that, there was no much oxygen because oxygen reacts and it's uh, trapped as oxides. And it's exactly the enrichment of the terrestrial atmosphere in oxygen that uh, allowed the aerobic metabolism of the evolution to more uh, evolved species uh, uh, as the mammals. So all this history of the terrestrial atmosphere is trapped in samples that are on the lunar regolith. The other component of the moon environment is the exosphere. Actually, the exosphere is very tenuous. A coalition atmosphere has several sources, of course. It comes from solar wind, we have sputtering. We have atoms that are uh, ejected. Uh, uh, we have uh, 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 gases that uh, 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 come out of the lunar regolith through vaporization, through sub, uh, 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 sublimation. We have macrometeorite bombardment that extracts gases. And these uh, various components co contribute to, to an exosphere. Here we have uh, a simulation uh, uh, by uh, 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 Stern and also by Peter Wurz of the density of these species that co contain hydrogen, helium, methane, argon, uh, krypton, uh, uh, xenon, so sodium also as a function of the altitude. And then this exosphere interacts also with the dust the dust is another component. It comes either from the uh, 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 interplanetary dust, either from what is ejected from the micrometeorite impact. It, it gets charged due to photoelectron uh, uh, phenomenon. And so we have a very complex system. We have the moon, it interacts with the solar wind plasma, interacts with the magnetotail plasma when the moon gets within the Earth's magnetosphere. We have charging of the surface, positive on the uh, part that's uh, illuminated by, by, by the sun, beautiful electron emission, negative on the uh, an, an, an night side. And we have multi-scale interaction between the interior, the surface, the exosphere, the magnetosphere, the interplanetary space. So we have a very complex multi-scale system and there are uh, uh, very exciting questions how this system works with all of these uh, couplings on very different scales. And now we come to uh, the uh, 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 to the experimental uh, uh, support that uh, we are looking forward, and the, uh, uh, what we are looking is the lunar orbital platform. It's also called Deep Space Gateway. Actually, it's a good platform that will be assembled. It will start uh, uh, probably next year up to the uh, 2000 uh, to the late 2008. So. It there are several phases and will be operating in the vicinity of the moon by NASA, ESA, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And it will support lunar activities, including the Artemis product to return humans to the moon. So it's a component of the Artemis project, but also it's a standalone uh, a project. It has various objectives, uh, uh, both support the human activities, but one of them is science and tech and technology. So it will be a platform to install instruments for various domains, plasma physics, uh, 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 dust, but also biology experiment. And uh, in preparation of the scientific uh, payload, is a set up science teams to prepare for payload studies on various domains, including uh, 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 in, 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 including radiation, in, in, uh, including dust, including biological effects, but also in one, a topical team in the field of space plasma physics. And I'm going to present you the results of uh, uh, this uh, uh, topical team on space plasma physics. But let's have a closer look to the gateway. So it will start being assembled uh, during the phase one. It, uh, initially, there will be a few elements. 
the first element, which uh, almost already is the power and propulsion element, which uh, will have these huge solar panels to provide energy, but also uh, the, the end propulsion engine to, to maintain orbit. We have the habitation logistic outpost will be the first habitat uh, uh, part, the logistics module. They will be on the side uh, 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 possibility to uh, for docking for the human landing system, the ascent element, the descent element. Of course, now this is changing because uh, uh, one of the uh, contributions uh, 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 to the human uh, uh, landing system would be the starship, but this is uh, uh, just a, a schematic of what it could be. And of course, it will be a, a, a dock for, uh, 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 for the Orion uh, uh, spacecraft. And then later phase, more and more modules will be uh, uh, added, particularly international habitat being prepared by NISA and uh, more and more uh, elements. What will be the orbit? Actually, the orbit of the gateway, there were several orbits that were initially considered, I show them here, but the one finally retains the near rectilinear halo orbit, which is here in black. We can see it on the upper right part, it, it's an orbit that has a, a very a, a periapsis. It's at about 3,000 kilometers, so it's not very low, but uh, there were uh, actually terrible control issues that dictated these values. And then apoapsis, which is below the South Pole uh, uh, of the Moon at 70,000 kilometers. So it's a, 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 a very big orbit. It brings the gateway if far, far enough uh, uh, from the moon, 90 degrees inclination. And the characteristics of this orbit, it's that it has constant Earth visibility. That's, as the moon rotates around the Earth, the, the orbital plane also uh, 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 is synchronous to it. And we have constant Earth visibility and we have a 9 to 2 resonance with the lunar synodic period. And what is the attitude? Actually, the main axis of the gateway is oriented towards the sun. XY is a plane or plane of the moon. Uh, on, the, on, the on, on, on the left, yes, here, here, exactly. It's the orbital plane of the moon, exactly. And here is the L2 Lagrange point of the Earth Moon system. So this is behind the moon. Actually, uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, L2 halo orbit is very well suited for uh, 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 relay satellites for operations on the far side of the moon, where we don't have constant Earth visibility. For example, the Changi. Uh, 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 spacecraft that, 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 that will land on the moon in, in, in the next days, there's a relay satellite that uses this kind of orbits. And here we have the direct uh, 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 retrograde orbit that was used during uh, uh, Artemis uh, 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 one mission. And here is the orbit that has been retained for uh, 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 the gateway. And there was already a small experimental satellite that was put on this orbit to test the dynamics and the orbital stability. So our topical tip on uh, space plasma scientific opportunities. We got a mandate to identify the science objectives and what's the corresponding summary to address it. Actually, this is a, a science verification matrix. On the left side is the scientific objectives that we had identified. For example, monitor the solar wind. Actually, it's not a, 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 a scientific objective by itself, but as a driver for the dynamics of the terrestrial magnetosphere, of the terrestrial lunar exosphere, and of the lunar surface and spatter charge, all these phenomena that we saw previously. What do we need to measure then? We need to measure solar wind density and velocity. We need to measure the interplanetary and magnetic field. And what's the kind of instrumentation that we need? It is the best by Faraday, couple and prostatic analyzer, and of course, a magnetometer. Then, what are the character characterize the solar energetic particles and galactic cosmic rays. So for radiation environment, also as a lunar surface spattering source for all these pattern mechanisms that we saw. So we need to have energetic particle detectors that monitor and characterize the, the response of the terrestrial magnetosphere to solar wind with a wide coverage of geospace. So this can be uh, done either by remote sensing as with an energetic neutral atoms uh, imager or a soft X-ray uh, imager to monitor the charge exchange X-rays, or it can be uh, 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 measured uh, in situ. Then monitor solar wind interaction with the lunar exosphere, regolith and magnetic anomalies. So in this case, we need to uh, image low energy ENAs. Also, 
reveal the solar wind iron dynamics in the vicinity of lunar magnetic anomalies. Actually, again, through these ENAs from the uh, gateway orbit, we can uh, monitor them. And here, so we need a series of ENA images starting from high energy, medium energy, low energy, or monitor the terrestrial and lunar exospheres, also the plasma sphere, which can be done with a UV, a UV spectro imager. And of course, monitor ambient plasma in different environments, solar wind, magneto shift, terrestrial magneto tail, lunar wake. And of course, we need in situ measurement of plasma density, temperature, composition. So we identified, we start from science objectives, what we need to study, what are the physical parameters then that we need to study, and what's the kind of instrumentation, either for instance or remote sensing that we need to study. And the next step that we were uh, asked by Isha to, uh, uh, to proceed is to translate the scientific, the science rational for space plasma physics instrumentation to a set of technical requirements. So what can, how can we proceed? How can we make a conceptual design? And the first thing that we need to do is to simulate the gateway plasma and environment interaction because all of these huge structures, they have the bad reputation of being electromagnetically dirty. What they would mean by this is that we have photoelectron emission which create, creates a crowd of photoelectrons, they get charged positively. This means that they repel positive ions for reaching them. So we need to understand how it operates and then to proceed on a conceptual payload design addressing these objectives and that I did identify a Stroman payload which is compatible with technical requirements. So what I'm going to present is a notional study. It's a conceptual study the, and it's for the late gateway of phase, the, the late gateway phase two. So the first thing we need to simulate the interaction of the gateway with plasma and environment. Actually, when you expose a body to, uh, to space plasma, you have photoelectron emissions. It's escaping photoelectrons, this IP carbon. So the, the, the body gets charged positively. So it attracts some of the photoelectrons back. So we have some return current, and then also it's exposed to electrons. So it will lead, it would reach a, a, an equilibrium potential, which we call space pot floating potential. Here is symbolized by VPF, and it's actually the uh, the dynamic equilibrium we call all of these uh, currents getting to the object or leaving the object. And for uh, 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 this, we collaborated uh, with the uh, Onera institution, and we used the space with space plasma interaction system software tool to simulate the gate of environment with the ambient plasma population. And here are the results. So when we started this study, we were, as I said, we were quite afraid that we would get a horrible plasma environment. But it was a nice surprise. The environment is not so bad. On the left side, here we have the main gateway. Here we have the solar panels of the pilot power and propulsion element. And solar winds are arriving from the right. And we have the electrostatic potential when the gateway is in solar wind. And as you can see, the potential, the positive potential reached is not so high. Here, we zoom in it, we saturated the scale actually at, at plus five volts in order to see the shift. And this shift is here, this structure, and we measure it is, in these simulations, the thickness of the shift is 1.8 meters, almost two meters. So it's quite reasonable. This means that with a mast, to, uh, just two meters, we can get out of this shift and measure pristine solar wind. And here we have the ambient proton density. The solar wind arrives from the right. Here, you can see clearly this wake as the supersonic solar wind arrives from the right. Here, we have this huge solar pulse, of course, this enormous wake. So the power propulsion element here is not well situated, but we can identify places which are the most favorable to put plasma instrumentation. And of course, the remaining positions can be used for energetic particles, which do not care for small potentials or in magnetospheric imaging instruments. Here, we simulate the other uh, case where it is in, in uh, the, uh, the gateway is in the terrestrial magnetotail, and we have energetic oxygen ions outflowing from the atmosphere and sending down tail. Here, we have the potential in the magnetotail, which again, it's not enormous, goes up to uh, uh, 13 electron volts. Here we have the photoelectron density. And again, 
it's manageable. And here we have the O plus ion resting magnetic tail. Actually, Earth is on the right. So the uh, uh, oxygen ions from the terrestrial ionosphere, they are streaming here. And you can see again this way. So we identified the most favorable positions of for the plasma instruments. And these are these positions. So we took a typical configuration, of course, for these simulations. We cannot simulate any possible configuration, but just uh, uh, to start. And in green, we have the logistic modules, the sun pointing side, this one. It has the advantage of having very small surface charging and space potential, no wake effect, and also direct phase exposure to the solar wind. Also, the US habitat, it has small surface charging, but uh, it, uh, it, it has no direct exposure to the solar wind. And the, the most unfavorable positions are here on the backside, the power and propulsion uh, uh, element and the hollow structure. So we took these results and we say now we have to design an instrument package to take advantage of the most favorable positions. And we came out into a solution where we have to group the instruments in two instrument platforms, the main instrument platform and secondary instrument platform. The main instrument platform, you can see it here on the logistic modules on the sun facing side, actually plus X points to the sun. The secondary instrument platform is on the back side of the logistics module. And here you can see a view of this platform which is double-sided with some masks on it. And we're going to zoom now on it. So here's the main instrument platform. On it, we have the solar wind ion spectrometer with its field of view. Then we have an ion mass spectrometer, which will also be placed on this platform. Actually, we took as example uh, a, 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 pro, uh, uh, a laboratory prototype that we develop uh, 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 in my institute in Iraq in Toulouse uh, that has a, a, a mass resolution adequate to separate nitrogen from oxygen ions, which are very closely spaced. Then we have a low energy DNA imager. And then here we have a mask on which we put the wave instrument, electromagnetic wave instrument. And then here is the other side of the same platform. We have a solar wind Faraday cap. We have the medium energy ENA imager, which we put on a rotating platform as on Voyager in order to scan different directions. We have the electron spectrometer. Actually, uh, this is based on the electron uh, spectrometer that's on board uh, the, the MAVEN spacecraft on uh, orbit around uh, uh, Mars. And we have these booms on which we put it's a new development that uh, from our colleagues in Belgium, where in the same instrument, they combined a Langmuir probe and a magnetometer. It's a clever way to have two instruments in one. And these are, of course, boost two meters long. And then we need also to have an energetic particle instrument. Actually, we designed an instrument that has two different fields of view, oppositely directed. Why this? Because on one part, we need to, to, uh, to measure the pristine galactic cosmic rays of solar energetic particles as they arrive before they interact with the moon. On the other side, we have to look on the moon surface to see all these albedo particles that come from the interact, that generate from the interaction of these energetic particles with the moon regolith, and that they give us information on this interaction and so on the regolith. So we put it here on the side. And we designed an instrument actually it's based on this instrument. We have uh, 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 it's an evolution of the instrument we had uh, uh, designed for the Demeter spacecraft with ions going up to 100 MeV and electrons up to 30 MeV. And then, in order to go up higher in energy, we have to have a galactic cosmic ray detector. And we used uh, as a baseline for this study the mini pan analyzer that was developed from the University of Geneva in cooperation with CERN. And this is an instrument that has strong magnetic side. So we cannot place it close to the other instruments because the magnetic field would perturb the uh, 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 trajectory of ions and electrons. And uh, it, 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 so it has, uh, it, it goes up to five GeV, it's a standalone instrument. And then we have the other platform for the remote sensing instruments. It's on the dark side, 
of the uh, gateway. So we, uh, uh, no stray light to perturb the uh, these uh, uh, instruments. And we, on this, we put on the two sides two different instruments: the uh, UV imaging spectrometer. Actually, it's based on the instrument on the Febus instrument that's now on board Depi Colombo. And on the other, we have an energetic neutral atom instrument. Actually, it's based on what is on, on, on what was on board Cassini. We, we took it as, as a baseline example, but of course, it's it's a nice uh, example. And again, on the on a rotating platform. And then we had to simulate how the fields of use of this instrument operate as the gateways along its orbit. First thing, what happens with energetic particle detectors? Here we have the moon. Here we have the uh, 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 orbit. And when we are on periapsis, we have the op two opposite direct fields of view. One is the purple one, which is looking upwards. So to precipitating priests and populations. The other is the yellow, which is looking towards the nadir. And as you can see, the field of view of this downward looking detector head is filled up by the moon. So this means that on this detector head, we get only albedo particles and not pristine. So it's a good way to separate the two populations. Then here we simulate the low energy ENA instruments, the tennis field of view here in magenta near periapsis because we need with this instrument to see the low energy ENAs that are created from the uh, 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 in, uh, in interaction of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the solar wind with the lunar exosphere, the lunar regolith. And here we have the medium, the medium energy ENA uh, instrument. We have a simulation along the orbit and by using the turntable, the either point of the moon and get exclusively ENAs coming from the moon or to the earth and get ENAs coming from the terrestrial magnetosphere from the plasma sheet. So we run these simulations for several parts of the orbit. And then here on the left side, we have the uh, galactic cosmic ray detectors field of view near periapsis. So it's a single point of view, but uh, as we see, its field of view is filled up by albedo energetic particles that are the result of interaction of precipitating uh, galactic cosmic rays with the lunar regolith. And during the remaining part of the orbit, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, mo that's most of the time, uh, this instrument points to the open sky and provides access to uh, the pristine galactic cosmic ray environment. So this is an instrument example that uh, uh, we consider uh, uh, when we undertook uh, this uh, study about start about uh, uh, three years ago, it was ju just at the breakup of the of the pandemic. But I would uh, 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 like to grasp this opportunity to speak for, of uh, about another uh, uh, excellent candidate, a uh, high energy uh, instrument that was developed in Greece, and it's the LURAD. The, uh, it's a comprehensive radiation monitor package for galactic cosmic rays, solar jet particles, and albedo species, detecting protons, electrons, heavy ions, gamma rays, and neutrons. It was developed by uh, a team from the University of Athens and from the Mokritos and from other Greek institutions. Uh, and uh, actually, the paper describing just came out. Yeah, or in advanced space uh, 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 research. So it's, it constitutes another excellent example of an instrument that could be used either on the gateway or uh, on the lunar uh, uh, surface. And then what we have seen until now are notional instruments for the late gateway phase study. But for phase one, to be more realistic, there will be three instruments that are already selected and they would fly. One is Hermes, which is an acronym for Helios Physics, Environment and Radiation Measuring Experiment Suites prepared by NASA. And we see here the example. It will be placed on the PP in the propulsion element. Actually, as we saw in the simulation, this is not a good place for such a kind of instrument. But at the first phase of the uh, gateway, that will be the only location available. So you have to do with what you have. And in order to alleviate uh, these pr uh, uh, problems, uh, they will put it on, on, on a long boom that will stand out. And it contains an ion mass spectrometer, an energetic electron analyzer, energetic particle detector, and a magnetometer. 
The other is the ERSA, the European Radiation Sensor Array provided by ESA. And the other is IDA, which internal dosimeter array is a collaboration between ESA and, and JAXA. And then the next step is the moon surface. Uh, 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 ESA just uh, 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 started a, 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 a few months ago uh, with facility definition teams for different uh, 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 domains. One is charged dust, uh, 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 the other is uh, 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 plasma. And the idea is to design an instrument package as a potential European contribution to crude land admissions. For Artemis IV, there are high level discussions between NASA and NISA who would provide what? And the uh, idea that's coming out is that the astronauts of, from the Artemis IV or Artemis V mission, when they arrive on the moon surface, they would put out an instrument package to study the moon plasma environment. By plasma, we mean the whole plasma components. That's energetic particles, charged dust, electric fields, magnetic fields. So uh, Astrolip will provide in situ measurements to help understand the complex interactions and dynamics of the dusty lunar surface with solar radiation, space plasmas, energetic particles, meteoritic flux, and exosphere. And such measurements will help characterize the associated physical mechanisms acting at the surface and to constrain environmental models in preparation for safe and sustain lunar surface operations. Actually, we want to start this kind of studies as soon as possible before too much human activity uh, 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 perturbs the, the lunar environment and also to help set up specifications in order to safeguard as much as possible the lunar environment and keep it as much pristine as possible. And here, just have a photo from the first meeting of our team last January. The, it's a work in progress. The first results of this uh, study, which, uh, as I say, is continuing, so it's not yet finished, will be presented next month at the European Lunar Symposium in Scotland. But a, 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 a more uh, detailed presentation will be given at the European Space Weather Week that will be next November in uh, in Portugal, and I would like also to take this opportunity to advertise that there there will be a, a, a moon space weather session in which open now for abstract uh, submission. And as you certainly know, Greece recently signed the Artemis Accord. Here we have a photo of the signature with uh, 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 Professor Giannis uh, 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 the, the Gliese during the uh, signature uh, uh, process of the Artemis Accord that they establish a practical uh, set of principles to guide space exploration uh, co in cooperation among nations. So they provide a legal framework for Greece to participate on instrumentation, either on the gateway or on the moon surface. And just before finishing, some news about the Changi 6 uh, mission, which now on moon orbit. It will schedule for a uh, uh, landing v very soon. It will land for the first time on the South Pole Aitken, Aitken Impact Basin on the lunar far side. Here we have an image. And it will be brought back from the first time samples from the far side of the moon. And on board Changi 6, there is an instrument provided by our institute in Toulouse, the Dorn instrument. The DORN instrument, actually, DORN is detection of gas radon. Radon is one of the components of the exosphere. It comes from nuclear reactions within the regolith. It's through cracks, it's out uh, gassed. And it detects a radon, not directly, but indirectly, because it also is a radioactive gas. It decays and in, in gives uh, uh, alpha particles. And this energetic particle detectors that their spectral response is optimized for the energy of these alpha particles coming out of the radioactive decay of uh, 
uh, uh, of radar. So the objective is to study the lunar outgassing through the regolith and study the transmogrin the lunar exosphere. Uh, last week, the instrument was switched on for the first time in the moon uh, environment on moon orbit. It gives very nice measurements, very clear separation between when the uh, uh, Changi is on the uh, uh, on the side is exposed to the solar wind and then when it comes behind the moon so we see the wake so the first measurements are very very encouraging and we are looking forward to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, moon landing on june 2 well we will be able to measure a uh, radon for the first time just from uh, as it comes out from cracks of the uh, 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 lunar surface so the, uh, uh, to conclude, the moon is a unique location to, study, to study deep space plasma environment and the deep, deep space gateway lunar orbital plasma is well suited for energetic particle and space plasma physics uh, research and also in preparation of further activities to study this population closer from the moon surface. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, it was very, very interesting talk. It is time for questions. So first, uh, let's see if there are questions from people here in the room. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for a very nice presentation. I mean, it, it looks like uh, your lunar environment is going to be the most studied environment ever. <laughs> uh, when you obviously, uh, our Earth uh, body, but uh, how is this managed from the standpoint of who does what and who pays for what? So, <laughs> with so many countries and uh, so many agencies. It's a very interesting uh, question. Actually, of course, NASA has the lion's share in this. There are a lot of private actors uh, companies participating, for example, uh, 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 whereas on the Apollo missions everything was provided by NASA, now they are private companies, but they get funding from NASA to build their instruments because if there is no funding from NASA, or private capital cannot support this activity because, of course, it's an uh, interest that, uh, that is behind all of that. Then Europe needs to uh, uh, participate. There is more and, and more conscious in ESA that uh, 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 Europe needs to be an active partner on it. So uh, actually, uh, Europe will uh, uh, not only pa uh, uh, is participating in the Artemis project, for example, it's providing uh, 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 the, the service model for the Orion spacecraft. It will provide also uh, uh, the international habitation uh, model, but also on instrumentation. And now uh, uh, the question is that uh, the gateway has a limited uh, 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 capacity for instrumentation. So, how many countries are providing instrumentation and who takes this and this place? Actually, when ESA uh, asked us to perform this conceptual design study, and Watson, what is ESA going to finally make? Let's don't limit yourself, design a dream package, put everything on it. We were aware it was not possible that. Finally, very few of the instruments that are in the study I showed will fly because it's a sharing between NASA, JAXA, ESA, Canadian Space Agency, but the ESA needed to have their hands, a complete study of a complete instrument package. So to have a good negotiation advantage in negotiating on what instruments could be provided. And then, uh, national governments in European countries, they are also helping. So, and there will be an, eco an economic ecosystem on the, on, uh, on the moon, which we are waiting to see what it will give. Nobody really knows how it will evolve. And actually it's because at the high level, there is a political will to go to the moon and move as a technology demonstration, as a, 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 a demonstration of power, but also to help advance science and technology, that there, there's a rush 
for all these activities, but nobody knows at the long term how this is going to work. Also, Moon is presented as a first step before sending, if ever, a man to Mars. One of the ideas is to take the gateway as it is and use it as a human vessel to send to the uh, to Mars because uh, the, the energy that you need in order to get out of moon orbit is much less than the energy you need to get out of the Earth's gravitational field. So, but how it, what, how is it economically sustainable in the long term? Nobody knows. This is really a very interesting question. Okay. So, uh... Yeah. So what is the time frame? When is this supposed to look like this? Uh, at, at, at the end of, the, uh, 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 of, of this decade, 2028, 30, but we have been, we have seen the program shifting as all big space projects. Actually, the power propulsion uh, element is already built. Also, the uh, habitation model that they are already uh, 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 built. And uh, 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 the, the initial idea was that from the uh, uh, land humans to Mars, the gateway would be used from the first mission. That's it, it, even from Artemis uh, uh, 3, the astronauts will uh, uh, use the gateway with the human landing system to go from there to the moon. Actually, it will not be ready. There are also serious questions whether the starship that will be used as a human line system will be ready. Access early June, the next uh, text uh, test uh, flight. So, and for Artemis, uh, 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 for apparently, they will not use the gateway, but they go directly with the starship if it's ready, directly on the moon, and they will use the gateway from uh, uh, Artemis five or Artemis six. So it's constantly shifting. But the, the the idea is that this it will look like that uh, uh, in uh, five six years from now. Starship will dot with the gateway. Yes. Actually, it will dot as the human landing system. If I go back, here you have the human landing system and uh, this docking port, the Starship will get on this docking port. So this is another design for the human landing system with the ascent, the descent module. And then the, there will be also the blue moon built by Blue Origin that will be used on the uh, 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 later flights, with, which would also dock uh, uh, there. I was actually covered by... Oh, okay, really? Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do we know what is the reason of the existence of this small magnetosphere to send the moon to the core? Or the idea that is prevailing, but we are not uh, really sure, is uh, the, uh, 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 that these are metal rich asteroids that were implanted of the moon because you have some asteroids that are uh, 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 full of metal as the Psyche mm -hmm. asteroid actually they come from colis of planetesimals and we have the iron core that remains that forms an asteroid so when this uh, such an asteroid bombards the moon it gets implanted on it so we have a huge metal uh, uh, mass that gets implanted on the moon so that that's the origin uh, uh, of, of these magnetic uh, anomalies that they are also called uh, swills. The first time they were uh, uh, detected was during the uh, uh, Apollo, uh, uh, the, th the three uh, last Apollo missions, 15, 16, 17, when there was a scientific sub-satellite and there was uh, an experiment by Kenzie Anderson, an electron reflectometer. Kenzie Anderson had the idea, why don't we put an electron instrument to, to sense electrons that are reflected from the moon surface if there is a magnetic field? Mm -hmm. And as the sub-satellite rotated around the moon, they identified clear electron reflection signatures over given locations. 
And then there were uh, studies that identified uh, that they showed that uh, 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 there was also a clear optical uh, visual difference, lighter or darker, and this is due to the screening from uh, uh, so, uh, uh, a solar or wind uh, exposure. So this is the uh, and also they correspond also to gravitational anomalies due to the uh, 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 heavy mass that's implanted there. What we call the mass force. That's why the, the gravitational field of the moon uh, uh, is, is not very fast very spherical it has higher order uh, 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 components due to all of these implanted heavy, 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 heavy masses and that's also the reason why low lunar orbits are quite unstable because when they go over the mass cons they do that very interesting but, but very small magnetic sphere yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nice. let, let me check the relationship mm -hmm. from people work so sad is better yeah okay yeah Okay, uh, but if there are questions, let me check here. Oops. So uh, if someone wants to ask a question, just unmute and speak or raise your hand so that we see. I don't see any. Hopefully we don't miss any. Okay, no problem. Okay. So then, uh, thank you very much again. Observe for that. And step there, Malik, sir. And we're going to follow the wrong thing.